I'm Steve Wheeler and I'm here at the Technical University of Budapest in Hungary to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the European Distance and E-Learning Network. Now many people have contributed to the success of Eden over the years and I'd like to mention to you three men in particular. When I was in Turkey about 20 years ago I was at a conference and I met three men. Uh, Sir John Daniel, Michael Moore and Tony Bates three of the founding fathers of modern distance education. We caught up with them at this conference and I interviewed them. Here is the story. Enjoy. Gentlemen, thank you all for coming in today to spend time talking to us about distance education. Um, you've all had a, a long, in, illustrious career in distance education and I, I'd like to take you back to the start of your careers and ask you, what were your individual visions for distance education? And has distance education panned out as you expected? Have there been any surprises along the way? We'll start with Tony. Well, I didn't have a vision when I came to the Open University. I was looking for a job um, as a researcher. So what happened was that it turned out to be that the uh, university provided a philosophy and an approach that I was really comfortable with, uh, particularly the ability to give access to people who weren't able to get access at that time through a very selective higher education system. What's changed since then is that most countries have opened up their higher education systems considerably. So in a sense, the, the original need of the Open University has changed a great deal. So the change has come about because of widening access through government policy, making more university conventional university places available. Um, and what's happened now is that many of the things that I was doing in the Open University have now become almost standard practice within conventional universities, such as online learning, use of technology for teaching and so on. So that's, that's the way it's changed for me. Mm. So John, same question, how, how has distance education panned out for you? Well, I first came across it, uh, I was doing some part-time studies in educational technology and had to do an internship. Um, and this was when everyone was talking about the Open University back in 1971. I was working at the University of Montreal at the time. Anyway, I did an internship at the Institute of Educational Technology and it just blew me away. Uh, the scale, the enormous enthusiasm of these students, the what seemed very, very strong dedication of not just the faculty, but all the people in the university to moving the students along. I mean, it was just a complete new experience. I decided, you know, this is what I want to spend my life doing. It just, as, as T.S. Eliot said, I was no longer at ease in the old dispensation. So I went back to Montreal and was lucky enough to get a job very quickly at the tele-university, which is Quebec's Open University. Um, what has been, I suppose, a complete surprise is the way that it has been adopted generally, because in the early days, someone said um, the main effect of the opening of the Open University has been to close all the other universities even more fully. A lot of people predicted back at that time that this was going to make all universities change, the creation of the OU, but actually it didn't. It almost sort of slowed that change down. And I suppose it was later technology and then pressure from governments that, that created the situation that, that we have now. So a bit like Tony, I mean, I didn't come in there with a vision. I was just so uh, impressed by the reality of a large open university doing things at scale with media. I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I want to be in this part of it and I don't really care what happens to the other part provided I can go in this part of it. And, and Michael, um, you started uh, at, at a very early stage in distance education. It must have been very primitive technologically in them days, but what's your, what was your vision then? Well, I, I was a school teacher at the beginning uh, of my career. Um, the kind of class I taught had two, uh, two sections. Uh, in those days, they called it the grammar school and the, uh, and the others. My heart, I found, always went to the others, the kids who came from the less deprived. Uh, this is now looking back. I wouldn't have been able to say this back then. But I then went for seven years into Africa, <clears throat> and I, I was introduced to radio in Africa. And again, it was the people who could not have opportunity 
that I found that as I learned about radio, it was possible to get learning opportunities out to people who were otherwise, otherwise deprived. Um, and it was always, I never, I, my career became an academic career, but after I left university, I never expected to go back into university education. Um, but it was the um, it, it was the way of getting out to the people who were otherwise not able to um, to be in education. I, I I had a stroke of luck and was invited to go to the U.S. Um, and uh, my mentor there, his book was called Learning at the Back Door, and that again kind of all sums it up. You know the. The, the method, we in distance education in those days were on the outside. We were outside the mainstream, we weren't very highly regarded, uh, and we were um, attending to the people who were also, wanted to learn outside, outside the mainstream. So that was, when you use the word vision, that was always my personal kind of uh, uh, motivation, vision, attachment. So I'm getting the impression from Oliver that it's about making education more accessible. That, that's the key element of what distance education has been all about these past few years. Um, now I'm seeing a lot of digital technologies emerging. We're having, we, we've even got them in our pockets, computers in our pockets now. Digital technology seems to be ubiquitous. Is distance education still a term that is useful? Oh, I'll go to you first, Michael. Asking me first. Um, I do rather regret the confusion, the, the conceptual confusion that I think we now labor under. I think the, the colleagues that are sitting here, uh, we, we do really speak the same language. It's a pleasure for me to come to an international conference and run into John Daniels and Tony Bates, because we start off with a common vocabulary, a common worldview. We can, we can accommodate terms like e-learning and, and all the rest that comes along, because we, we've got our basic uh, conceptual structure, I think, is pretty solid, with solid historical roots. Um, I worry a little bit about the, uh, about, about the generation following us in this huge, you know, tsunami is an overused term, but essentially this is a tsunami of change of, of everybody coming into the field. And they need help, I think, in sorting out, um, you know, the, the, the dimensions of the field. And one of my regrets, in a way I'm encouraged to see the, the proliferation of journals um, and of teaching, but I also worry about how little teaching there is, and as far as the journals are concerned, you know, it is an awful mixture of quality in, in the literature. So, so I am concerned about the, uh, about the confusion of terminologies. Hmm. So John, same question really, is distance education now anachronistic, or, or is, is it the, the phrase we should still continue to use to describe it? I think it's a useful term for the professional community. A professional community has to identify with some word. This may not be the best one. And because, as was pointed out, this was a low prestige operation until quite recently, everyone who went into it invented new terms. It was distributed learning, it was this, it was that. And, uh, you know, we, we, virtual has now almost seemed to be dropped out. You know, it was virtual this. So I think for the professional community, it's good to have a word that we all know. If it's the journal with distance in it, that's probably for us. But I think for the general public, use what it takes. You know, if they switch on to online learning, then fine, use that. Um, but educational technology has always been very bad for trying to constantly change the vocabulary in order to give the impression that my little new, my little thing is, mm. is so new that it has to have a new a word. So I'm a bit relaxed about how you use the term distance. Okay, Tony, uh, what's in a name? <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a useful term. Um, I think it does differentiate those students who, I think it's more useful for differentiating students than, than teaching. Um, what kind of students you get in the, who are distant students, they tend to be very different from those that go on campus, although even that's breaking down a bit now. But I, I think it is a useful term. Uh, I agree there's lots of confusion. Um, uh, we're still trying to do a survey in Canada and it, we're arguing about whether it should be called a, a survey of distance education or a survey of online learning. 
because online learning can be both distant and something else. So the, it, it, it is very important that whenever somebody writes a paper or is discussing or arguing in this field, that they make very clear what they're talking about and don't mm -hmm. confuse the, the terminology. Um, it may sound pedantic, but um, it's not. It's really important. So um, we, we're agreed then that distance education, as, as a term, it still has some kind of credence to it, some, some kind of resonance to it. Um, but what about the theory behind distance education? Is it any different, really, from standard educational theory? Does, is there a need to have distance education theory as separate or as different from standard educational theory? I'll, I'll come, come to you first, Tony. I have problems with thinking of distance education as a separate theoretical field. I think it's a subfield of uh, general educational theory. Um, uh, I think it's been overblown in the past. Um, I think there are things that are different in, about students who are studying at a different distance. You have to be aware of that, but it's you know you you could also say that about adult education and so on and. I, th I think, you know, 99% of general educational theory will apply to distance and there's just a one t tiny 1% that, that doesn't. Okay. Would you agree, Sir John? Yeah, and I come at it actually through the, the lens of quality. I think the distance education press, because of its earlier low prestige, tried to say that everything, theory, quality assurance, had to be different. I mean, my view is that if it's quality education, it's quality education no matter what it is. Sure, distance ed requires you to look at some different things and check that they're being done properly. Uh, but I'm, I'm a strong believer that if, if, if you know, quality is quality and you can achieve it as well or better often through distance than you can in other ways. And the theory, I think it's been very helpful to make people in distance education think about what they're doing but as Tony says, I think, you know, that it, it's, it, they're really thinking about the general theory of education, which most academics don't at all because they're more interested in physics or engineering. And Michael? Well, I, I really began thinking about distance education seriously. Um, at first in the United States in the very early 1970s. And when I, I, I went as a student of education, and in the literature of education, there was nothing about the kind of education that I had personally experienced in the Africa experience I referred to. I mean, I knew that there, there were people learning um, at a distance uh, through radio, television, and other, uh, and other simple technology but the educational literature defined, it defined um, education as a process that occurred between a teacher and a learner in a classroom. So there was absolutely no theory. Uh, so I, mine is a slightly different perspective from my friends because uh, perhaps my own personal story, I felt that there was need to run up a flag and make some kind of statement about what it was that I knew some people were doing um, overlooked and disregarded, and getting something into the literature about the kind of teaching and learning where teachers and learners were not in the classroom. And the more you look at it, or the more I looked at it, the more it seemed that there was more, something like a continuum um, in the behaviors of teachers and the characteristics of learners uh, from those at one extreme where there was, shall we say, an extreme distance between the two um, and, and those where there were less. So when you look at the extremes, uh, there are characteristics of people who uh, respond to distance teaching methods somewhat differently than others and there are techniques of teaching somewhat different than others and I think they deserve uh, some kind of classification, categorization, organization, specification, publication. Uh, so, you know, I've always been a little stronger on the virtue of, of developing a theory of our own field. And it does contribute to the research. I mean, when students are coming, you know, a student comes to, to begin a, re, a doctoral research program, I think having the title distance education helps because you tell them what literature to go and start to look for, and then they'll find aspects that, um, that uh, lend themselves to research. So I think there's a research value in, 
in having uh, one's, not, not one's own definition, as the colleagues say, it's all part of the whole, but I'm a little more sympathetic perhaps than Tony is to the theory. <laughs> Michael Moore, Sir John Daniel, Tony Bates, thank you all very much indeed for spending time with us today during this interview. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>